an award-winning spectacular. Clint Eastwood, Gina Hackman, Morgan Freeman. World Spectacular, Unforgiven, March 17th, only on ATV World. Modern art. What do people see in modern art? Does it give us an insight into ourselves? Or into what it means to be alive in the 20th century? And man Saturday on World at 8.30. I was a really naughty kid. <laughs> Listening just didn't seem important. But I soon learned my lesson. Now, as a Prudential Life Insurance agent, listening to what people want out of life is the most important part of my job. Listening for over 140 years has made Prudential one of the world's top 10 life insurance companies. For over 80 years, we've been a part of Hong Kong. That's why we're in tune with what you want from a bank. We make it a point to listen, to understand, and to design services that cater to your needs. Think of us as a lifelong partner for you and your family. Bank of America Asia. The Spirit of Happiness, Dolce Vita, from Christian Dior. Better life with the regional council. For the news and the views, from high street trends to hip haute couture. For the latest advice on what's in, in style. Tune in for a complete world of fashion to Planet Fashion, Sunday at 7 p.m. ATV World. Stay tuned now for a roundup of all the day's top stories in tonight's Late News. Good evening. Two men remain in intensive care tonight after inhaling dangerous gases in a laboratory at the University of Science and Technology. Nine other people were also admitted to hospital after being exposed to the chemicals. Seven have since been discharged. How Davis reports. The accident occurred as a researcher and a postgraduate student were working in this laboratory. University staff refused to say if correct procedures had been followed in what should have been routine work involving the heating of chemicals in a cleaning operation. But what is known is that four people in the laboratory inhaled nitrogen dioxide and other acidic compounds. The four were taken to the United Christian Hospital just after half past one, two to intensive care and the others to general wards for observation. The hospital also requested that people near the scene of the accident be sent along and another seven men joined the more seriously ill three hours later. Doctors say it's hard to tell if the two men in intensive care will live. Well, I think at this moment it's too early to comment because it really depends on how much they have inhaled. But on the safe side, 
because of the history, we worry that they may have in, uh, inhaled a significant amount. So we place them in the intensive care because these few hours would be the most critical time. The university was involved in a similar incident less than a year ago. A postgraduate student, Lung Wai Chuk, died in April after inhaling spilt chemicals. As with that case, doctors today have admitted there's very little they can do for the patients other than to watch and hope. Hundreds of staff and pupils were evacuated from three schools in the new territories today after some pupils complained they could smell gas. The fire service was called in but could find no leak. James Wright reports. More than a thousand teachers and pupils were evacuated from the three schools, all in Tinsoi Wai. At the Toi Shing Catholic Secondary School, the staff and pupils were quickly taken to a safe distance and the area was sealed off. A total of 19 people from the school were taken to hospital, complaining of sore throats and headaches. Teachers and pupils from the Kwok Wok Wai Prevocational School and the Leung Khao Gui Primary School also went to hospital with a similar complaint. Most were discharged, but six people were admitted to the Chunman Hospital for observation. Fire officers with breathing apparatus made searches of all the schools, but found no evidence of a gas leak. So later this afternoon, pupils were allowed to return to their classes. The United Nations Agency responsible for refugees says it will be shutting down boat people camps throughout Asia by the end of June. The UNHCR says camps in Hong Kong will remain in operation longer so that the remaining 19,000 asylum seekers can be sent back to Vietnam. The announcement comes on the heels of a hostage taking at the High Island camp. Ray Rudowski reports. A tense hostage drama came to an end this morning at the High Island detention camp. Eleven hours earlier, a group of Vietnamese asylum seekers abducted a guard. They were protesting their forced return to Vietnam. The man was taken hostage during a riot in which police fired tear gas to stop an escape. Around 15 people had to be forced off roofs and into vans. They joined some 200 others taken to Victoria Prison to await their deportation. Guards expect more violence as deportations are stepped up. Well, the, the camp situation is changing and this, the, the, the overall situation is very volatile. Uh, we are watching the situation. The incident comes on the heels of the UNHCR's decision to deport all 34,000 boat people now in camps throughout Asia. That will be done by June 30th, 1996, but the agency will continue its operations in Hong Kong after that date. But the group won't say for how much longer. There is simply a limit to what burden the international community can carry prolong the stay in camps of people who are not refugees. The group Refugee Concern is highly critical of the UNHCR's work. The activists allege there are legitimate refugees among the 19,000 in Hong Kong's detention camps. But they say the UNHCR is refusing to help them. I think they will be remembered by um, the Vietnamese boat people as um, a betrayer of trust, which was placed in them. Beijing, meantime, today restated that it will not take responsibility for any Vietnamese boat people left after the handover and urged a quick end to the situation. The Financial Secretary, Donald Dung, has warned that the territory's economic growth rate would be halved if China loses its most favoured nation trading status. Speaking this evening, Mr. Dung said China is a vital trading partner and that the renewal of MFN should not be linked with political issues. Earlier today, Mr. Zhang defended changes in social welfare spending announced in his budget yesterday. Rahina Deluna reports. Donald Zhang was out soliciting comments from the community one day after unveiling his maiden budget. Many of the responses from a radio phone-in this morning dealt with the increases in welfare payments. The financial secretary later denied the extra spending represents a change in the government's philosophy. We are certainly not going into welfare state, but we, we certainly believe that welfare is important in this community. China has been a leading critic of the territory social spending, likening it to a car racing out of control. But Beijing's response to the new welfare spending so far has been conspicuously absent. But with the competing voices in Hong Kong, Mr. Zhang says he had taken all sides into account. There are contending pressures in the community. and. Uh, you, if you are here, I'm sure you will have, you have uh, what has been said so far by legis Legislative Council across the board, practically. 
uh, there seems to be more criticism on the on the what they call inadequate provision on in this regard. So some balance needs to be struck, and I believe the administration has struck the right balance. But many social welfare advocates disagree, saying the increases are not enough. Critics say the additional $200 million earmarked for public assistance programs is merely symbolic. China and Taiwan have traded angry words on the eve of missile tests near the island, which are scheduled to begin in the next few hours. Officials in Beijing said the military exercises will safeguard China's territorial integrity, while Taiwan's President Li Tonghui dismissed the missile tests as harmless. Meanwhile, American officials have continued to denounce the exercises as provocative and have warned of the consequences if the tests go wrong. All appears calm and quiet on the northeast coastal area of Taiwan. But from tomorrow, the peace will be punctuated by the sound of gunfire. This area lies just 25 kilometers away from China's missile test area to the north of the island. A second test site will be located to the south, in what are the closest exercises to Taiwan yet. The island's military are taking no chances. The caretaker of this watchtower says radar and other equipment have already been moved in. In Beijing, officials are dismissing international protests over the exercises, notably from the United States. A foreign ministry spokesman says China will never accept Washington's representations over Taiwan. Washington has repeated its adherence to a policy of one China, but has warned Beijing it could be playing with fire. We believe that the um, plans for these missile tests are irresponsible. And we have informed the Chinese government that there will be consequences should these tests go wrong. Mr. Burns says Beijing should cease all provocative actions against Taiwan. President Li Tonghui, whose visit to the U.S. initially sparked China's fury, says he won't be bullied by the missiles. The island is going to the polls for the first direct presidential elections in just over two weeks' time. Beijing has criticized an American report on human rights abuses in China. The Chinese Foreign Ministry described the document as an interference in China's internal affairs and accused Washington of having ulterior motives for releasing it just a day before Chinese missile tests near Taiwan. Military tensions are compounded by Washington's release of its annual human rights report, which cites China for widespread and well-documented abuses. China itself reported more than a thousand death sentences last year. The U.S. says the number is probably much higher. The Clinton administration's 1994 China policy assumed that continued trade with China will lead to better human rights. But the 1995 human rights report suggests that theory isn't working. By the end of 1995, the U.S. charges China had silenced almost all public dissent by intimidating, exiling, or imprisoning dissenters. U.S. officials are defensive about cutting off China. The most repressive periods in recent Chinese history have occurred in times of international isolation. And so isolation is by no means the answer to the problem of human rights abuse. The Human Rights Report also cites Russian President Boris Yeltsin's use of Russian forces against Russians in Chechnya, and what the U.S. calls reversals in Mr. Yeltsin's human rights record. Three American soldiers have been given lengthy jail terms after being convicted of raping a schoolgirl on the Japanese island of Okinawa. The judge described the case as malicious and brutal, but the lawyer for the three men said there would be an immediate appeal. Chandrika Deshpande reports. More than 300 people queued to draw lots for the 34 seats in the Okinawa courtroom. All were hoping to catch the dramatic end to the trial which began last November. Handing down sentence, the judge said the attack on the 12-year-old schoolgirl was vicious 
and that the servicemen's motive gave no reason for leniency. Two of the defendants were sentenced to seven years, the third to six and a half years. Many Japanese feel that the sentences are not tough enough. After the verdict, the mother of one of the defendants spoke to the media. I apologize to the victim. I'm sorry this happened. I'm so sorry that my son was even in the presence of whatever happened. But I want him to know that his family loves him and I'm going to stand by him regardless. The soldiers now have two weeks to appeal. Meanwhile, the governor of Okinawa, Masahide Ota, delivered a statement asking the Japanese government to reduce the American military presence. Okinawa is home to more than half the American troops stationed in the country. Their continuing presence remains a hotly debated issue. The leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization, Mr. Arafat, has called for an international conference to combat terrorism across the world. His comments came at the opening of the first meeting of the newly elected Palestinian Council in Gaza. Mr. Arafat has also launched a crackdown on Arab militants following the recent suicide bomb attacks in Israel. It looked a lot like an Israeli army operation, but these were Palestinian police tonight, raiding dozens of Palestinian institutions in their own territory. The police seized records from the offices of more than 30 social welfare agencies, charities that they say are the financial backbone of Hamas. Palestinian police today also displayed a huge collection of weapons they confiscated during the past week. Those two, we find it uh, yeah, in this morning at 4 o'clock. They also found what they said was a suicide bomber belt, complete with pipe bombs. The owner was arrested. Almost everywhere you look today, the Palestinian Authority, under intense pressure to crush Hamas, was trying to show that it was trying. A Palestinian court jailed this man for life. Mohammed Warda confessed to recruiting three of the recent suicide bombers. The Palestinian Authority then did something it has never done. It invited Israeli state television to one of its jails to interview Warda. As Prime Minister Shimon Peres watched, Warda said, if the military wing were to ask me to do another operation, I would say no. So the Israelis today were also out in force, closing down an Islamic university in Jerusalem and arresting suspected Hamas activists in Hebron. The battle against Hamas is now a rare case of Israeli-Palestinian armed forces aiming in the same direction. A British newspaper has reported that Princess Diana is demanding a £30 million divorce settlement from her estranged husband, Prince Charles. The report came as the princess appeared in public for the first time since agreeing to the divorce. The British tabloid, The Sun, said she had already been offered £15 million, but she turned it down. She allegedly told friends it was not enough to meet her needs for the rest of her life. The princess already receives £900,000 a year as part of a deal she reached with her husband when they separated more than three years ago. Finally, the weather. There'll be fog patches overnight and early tomorrow. But the rest of the day should be dry and warm, with temperatures ranging between 20 and 26 degrees. That's all from the ATV News Team tonight. Good night. is heading out to the wild, wild west, where danger lurks, cats prowl, and real mice are cowboys. Join the adventure as they hunt for those wagon trails paved with cheese. My Baby Babe, an American tale, Fievel Goes West, Friday at 9.35. Right, your job is to take messages. And take lots of messages at once, 24 hours a day, no days off. And I think $28 a month Sounds reasonable. Well, you can start now. Phone mail, the convenient way to get messages directly from your phone. Simply call 10012 now and it's yours. You know what to do. For over 80 years, we've been a part of Hong Kong. That's why we're in tune with what you want from a bank. We make it a point to listen, to understand, and to design services that cater to your needs. Think of us as a lifelong partner for you and your family. 
Bank of America Asia. Love Follows Us includes 12 famous Asian melodies performed by world-renowned musician Richard Claderman and other Delphine artists. Chertram, the cutest, the cuddliest, the most courageous cat in Japan. He has the most exciting escapades with friends and foes, but can too much curiosity kill the cat? My Baby Babe, The Adventures of Chatran. Saturday on World at 9.35. This is ATV World. Welcome to the China Taiwan News Express. We begin with China's CCTV Daily News, presented in Putonghua. Hello. Today is Sunday, September 7th. Welcome to the news.